Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another Tuesday afternoon program here with the Genealogy Center. We are glad that you're here with us today, and we're looking forward to today's program, which will focus on genealogy research in the South. So our speaker is Mark Lowe, and he has been researching families for more than 55 years. He grew up in Tennessee and has extensive family roots in Kentucky. And as a researcher and lecturer, he enjoys um, working with genealogical groups and professional organizations. And he's a former president of the Association of Professional Genealogists and former vice president and secretary of the Federation of Genealogical Societies. And he was awarded the um, Graham T. Smallwood Jr. Award by APG in 2007 and a lifetime membership award in 2019. So we're glad to have him here today Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. I see a lot of folks here from everywhere, and I appreciate you being there. And we're going to be talking about, I think, one of my favorite topics. Um, and it's not because I live here. It's really an interesting place, no matter where you're researching. If you've not researched in the southern U.S., it is a unique place with unique folks. And there's a lot of things to really make the the uh, the research there Um Come alive. There's lots of great stories. It's it is the land of storytelling. You know you know that, and so it's the opportunity to learn from people who passed along uh, the pathway. And I want to show you some of the things that will at least help. And we'll we'll keep them fairly fundamental, but you'll find in your handout that I've shared a lot of stuff that we won't get to talk about all those details. But I hope you'll hope you'll take the time to examine and play and explore. Because it's in exploring that we find things that we didn't know exist. Uh, imagine if someone had not gone into that hole in Edmondson County, Kentucky, for example, that discovered Mammoth Cave. Okay, And it was a simple process of hunting. Um, and, and it's like, oh, and going into things. So discovery is part of exploration. And as the part of research that we do is using the information that we observe and that we learn and that we listen to to find people, places, and the events that make a difference. Okay, well, let's look at that. Because in reality, uh, I love looking at this group of people. And literally, that's only part of them. Remember, it's just one line. But as folks were, were moving down the Appalachian Mountains, for example, westward across Pennsylvania, they were probably already thinking about what they could do when they got over the mountains. And often they had probably heard some stories, depending on the time period when your folks were moving. There were waves of folks traveling south and west and, um, you know, some even traveling back east as a point of looking at situations. And, and as they continued to wander down, some crossed through what we call the Cumberland Gap, um, slowing down perhaps to stay in Tennessee or Kentucky. But there were still other people in the east moving down the valleys into the Carolinas, Georgia, all the way into Florida, down into the Spanish territories, um, across the Mississippi River, Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, Oklahoma, the Great Plains, and even beyond, all the way to the to Pacific Ocean and, and further. Some folks continued not to stop, okay? Now, I will tell you that my grandfather would say that's so important to listen to the people who are working. Yeah, pay attention to those uh, that that actually have a role, and that's probably a good clue. It was always uh, it was always good to listen to some of the people talking, but one of the things I learned as a kid was that the people who were not working, and you'll know what I mean by that. I don't mean that they just were unemployed, but that people who were active and doing things, the information they supplied tended to have more fruitful uh, information. Okay, we'll look as we go through. Real quickly, though, I want to look at the, what the people who are traveling, and and uh, this is helpful because if you're doing this from the beginning and you've just started, or if you've been doing this for 50 years, go back and look about, think about the things that you use to build information. And often it would include those those folks who had already settled early or those who came into the area. And, and that's good whether we're talking about the 1700s or we're talking about 1850s, or we're even talking about 1910. So when we're looking in the South, one of the, the, the most important groups to look at would be what we call the first movers. 
Now, if we're looking in the settlement of a county or the settlement of a colony or territory, it's usually a smaller number of people initially. Uh, mostly the first, at least here in the States, would be adult males and 55 and up. And, and at least in this area, one of the reasons for that is because land quickly was offered to, say, Revolutionary War soldiers. Uh, uh, many of them already had property and didn't want to come, and so it was still other folks who would who would have been offered that property. But the folks who came and settled were probably leaders already in another community who came. And so if we look at some of the records about their stories, often it helps us learn where the other folks who followed them came um, and where their origins were that would help us while we make connections. You know, we don't go anywhere without making a connection. Now, following that, though, is all those regular folk. And, and that would be the folks who are farming, um, ministers, stock people who were doing livestock. We're going to have stores. We're going to have merchants. We're going to have some professionals. We need attorneys pretty quickly. We need some folks out there. We need doctors. We need folks to, um, we're going to have newspaper. We need those kind of things to communicate. Now, we're not going to have large things. It's going to be small. And we're going to have families starting to come. Okay, And in that process, as we're gaining more people, some are going to continue to like the area. They're going to be able to get good land or they're going to be able to lease property. Others are not. And they may move on or they may move back. Uh, one of the groups, though, that will help us pay attention to that is Bill and Millie. Okay. And these are the tagalongs and stop-offs, and <laughs> they are an important group to study in the South because as much movement is happening, and let me describe who they are. So that's Bill. Uh, Bill is the farmer's son, and they are moving. Uh, they're, they're coming into the territory. That's Millie. Millie is the daughter of the local miller, okay, grain miller. And so they've stopped in town, Bill and his family, because they're they're continuing, you know, they want to resupply. They've got some livestock. They want to resupply before they continue on to the land that they're trying to find. So in the process, Bill and Millie actually meet up in the process. Probably uh, uh, looks like he's just finished milking the cow. So uh, in, in that process, but Bill and Millie kind of hit it off. They like each other. Now, I will tell you this. Millie's dad saw young Bill and thought, he's a strong young buck. If, if they get together and he stays here, we'll be able to do more milling. I can expand the operations. There's so many people passing through here that that would really help, help my, my business. That'd be fine. Well, Bill's dad does the same thing. He looks at Millie and says, she's strong. She grew up in a, in a feed mill. She can tote bags. She can lift. So if we go, we can actually farm more land. Uh, they'll have healthy children, and we'll be able to continue expanding. So both Bill and Millie's uh, dads are like all in favor of it. Here's where the problem comes, okay? Really quickly, if Bill and Millie get married, they, there's a decision to be made, right? If Millie goes along with Bill and his family to the land, she's now a tag-along. She's going to be out there. Her family may not be there. They're here in this town where they've met. And so when you're looking at, there's like, I don't see any connection. One of the things you often have to do is follow their pathway. You may encounter then her family, okay? Um, the same thing would happen if now, if Bill decided, I'm not going on with, you know, with my family to that farm, I'm going to stay here. Millie and I are going to stay and I'm going to work for his dad in the mill. He's a stop off. Again, his family is not in the same place. And so often when we're looking for our families together, uh, you may have a tag along or a stop off and they are clearly one of the ways to resolve that is to follow those pathways back a little bit to see, oh, that's where they are. And often manuscripts may help if they're letters, documents. Well, we've got some folks that just like, I, I don't really wanna move. Um, some folks are taking care of their parents. There are other folks that are, uh, you know, taking care of the land until they, the other other family gets, you know, takes takes off and does well. Uh, and other people are just non-adventurous. Have you not, you know, now it's kind of tough. But when I was a young man, there were people who just refused to get onto the interstate highways to go. And we're not we're not that far from Nashville. And back 
you know, back in the day, it was fairly easy to go to doctor's appointments all over around the city because you could go on the back roads. You didn't have to get on the interstate. It's a little tougher today, um, but that, that's non-adventurous. And there are folks who are like that. Now, in every one of the groups, quickly, there are women. And so it's not that we're leaving them out. I'm just seeing where the, the primary folks are and look in every category to figure out where they are. Okay, so let's move forward so we can look at some information. One of the things I will tell you that the best clues I think are following these processes is to create a profile about the person. What do you know about them? And, and actually, before you start doing too much investigation, build enough information that you know a little bit about the person you're researching. And as you continue to grow, you're going to build that profile. You know, as you grow, their profile will grow. You'll begin to understand things become more clear. You want to always link your ancestor with their neighbor um, because when you're looking at records by the way and you can't find your ancestor in a record when you look for their neighbor in a record it often is a related case it's a related situation they may go to church together and in the town when i grew up with uh, my neighbor is the person who knew everything about everybody i didn't say it was all right but she knew something about every oh she knew something about everybody. Uh, understand the community, the neighborhood, the history, the cultural aspect, the churches, uh, the whole thing about the neighborhood, because it's so important to look around and see what's going on. It'll help you understand the people who are coming there, perhaps sometimes why people didn't stay. Uh, and maybe there were reasons that drew them to the area. That's understanding What's going on? What made people want to come here? Uh, what made people want to move to other places? Was it the price of land? Was it the quality of the land? Was it the type of produce you could raise? And you want to examine everything fairly quick, carefully. And I know that we know to do that. And I'm going to encourage you to always support your ideas as you're going forward with a research plan. Okay. Now, some days you just forget what it was you're looking for. And if you will, will stick with a good research plan, you're so much better off, so much, you're always better off because you can back up and you've still got your notes. You know where you're going, okay? Um, we don't yet have quite GPS that will tell us where to go to look for a record. We have to use the GPS we have to find those records uh, that are going to tell us information, okay? Now, I do want to tell you some strategies real quickly. Often when we get into a big family, we get all overwhelmed. I, I want you to mull and ponder. I want you to slow down. I want you to, you know, think about, get, get your iced tea. If you do that, relax. Because you need to not think about these complex. You want to break them down into manageable segments. Okay? You, you don't want to solve, you don't solve everything once. You, you ask a question. Find the answer and then learn from it, building the profile, because it allow you to focus your research upon the questions that you ask. You will accomplish more. And I'll tell you that um, having researched for a long time now that I do much better when I actually am somewhat relaxed and have time to really take it all in. Okay. As we go to the South, though, you're probably wondering. How do I how do I begin to think about where all these folks came from? That's complex. And I'll mention this at the beginning, but we'll talk about it. And it's definitely listed in your handout. But we'll use uh, strategies. And I'll be honest with you, having to research this long, these are the things, this list of items is what I use often to determine uh, where somebody originated, um, how they made a living, if they made a living. I can answer so many questions about the individual by using this variety of fundamental records, okay? And so I don't think it has to be something complicated. Use what you have available. It doesn't do any good to use something you don't have access to. And so you want to use and, and, and learn what can I extract from the information in front of me. Um, this is a map of land use from a book called The History of Agriculture in the Southern U.S. to 1860. And 
the advantage of this book, I'll, I'll be honest with you, this is a book that I learned about, I hate to tell you, it was about 48 years ago um, when I was in college and sitting in a class and I was reading through the book and I suddenly, I was probably not paying attention to what I was doing, uh, but I was paying attention to this because I began to see that I, I could identify what I already knew about genealogy based on the regional geographic conditions that I could spot on this map. And I, I took another class, I think the very next, we were on quarter system back, back in the old day, on quarter system, I took a, a class on soils, okay, it's not dirt. And in that one, I was exposed to a lot of what we call USG, uh, USGS maps. And in, I, I asked the professor about this, and, and he says, well, I think if you look at this, that you'll be able to see there is a correlation <laughs> between the land use areas and the actual uh, physical mapping with what we do today. And so I, I, I figured out how to overlap it. I had to go to a computer lab and, and uh, suddenly I was amazed. Okay, we can use what people produce as a crop or what livestock they raise as a predictor, if they're successful at it, as a predictor from whence they came. Okay, and we can't go into this too much, but just know that there's so much information that we can learn by looking at, at, at land use and the process of it and how people make a choice. For example, as you're looking at that map, you might notice those kind of purpley areas that are adjacent to either blue or green, okay? Uh, for example, where I live here is in, in central Tennessee. Uh, I'm, I'm toward the northern border, right on the Kentucky-Tennessee border, but there's kind of the blue, a blue and pink area there. You'll also notice that in the northern half of Arkansas and the southern part of Missouri, there's also a pink and blue. And if you go far to the east, uh, notice just along the central part of North Carolina's Piedmont, just south of that, you see a, a long pink streak, um, uh, it's kind of surrounded by green that runs on down into South Carolina. Well, what that tells me or what that, what that kind of correlates to is it was similar types of climate, soil, and it, it was very good soil for tobacco. Now, I live in a tobacco growing region. Probably it was known as the world's finest dark fire tobacco. It's a unique type of tobacco. The folks who came and settled here, um, starting with even Revolutionary War soldiers, were folks from that border area, those pink counties in North Carolina and Virginia, who came and settled in Middle Tennessee. And their revenue crop was tobacco. There were a few of them that went on to Arkansas and Missouri, settled in a similar area. Um, weather is a little different. Sometimes they can make better crops in different areas. But the point is, by studying this, it becomes a predictor. Now, can I get something even more solid? And absolutely. I've, I've listed in your handout uh, the kind of records that I think you want to look at and I'll show you examples of some fairly quickly, but these are included in, in your handout. Uh, the term probate means to record, but most of us recognize that those are wills and estates. And often it will refer to a property here that belonged to a sibling or to a parent or even a grandparent who lived in another area. And so we need to be diligent at reading all of these records. The next one, land records, same way, definitely. Deeds often reveal a different location of a uh, grantee or grantee in the land sale. It'll say they're from another place. Often it could have been from where they were moving from and to. Uh, same thing would be other folks in the deeds before and after the ones on our property. Where are these people moving from? It could be from the same place that our ancestors moved from. And we don't assume that. Uh, that they were just like if they came to Tennessee or came to Kentucky, we assume they were from North Carolina or Virginia, okay? Because people made choices when opportunity arose, uh, people took advantage of it. 
Um, there would be land grants, those revolutionary land grants we're talking about. There were a lot of folks who came from Virginia into uh, Kentucky because of the land offered to the to their soldiers. Uh, North Carolina did the same thing in Tennessee. And there were other states who were offering opportunities, and certainly a lot of the colonial states offered land in various places, but we're talking generally about the South. Um, they they kind of settled, at least in those areas, this is Kentucky's milita military district. And you'll notice that uh, it, it's kind of a long, kind of, uh, it's hard to, it's, it, if I should have had it where you could see the whole state, but it's south of the Green River, uh, and it goes over to the Tennessee River. And you'll notice the bottom half of that is 36 degrees, 30 minutes. And that's another thing about land in general, um, because the states didn't, the colonies were not happy necessarily with the way their borders were, and it took them a while to settle it. And so the border between Kentucky and Tennessee, for example, is wasn't settled uh, completely until about 1820. Tennessee also had a military district that covered part of the area where, where we are. Often it was not the those uh, soldiers who came, but neighbors or folks who were willing to uh, take the assignment of their land uh, and come. They were looking for property and the, guy, the other folks either died or already had property. So we might find either more information in some other records like court records. Uh, chancery cases are what also called equity cases in some states. They're often gonna refer to relatives or friends in other locations or, or depositions sometimes will tell where somebody was born are raised. And sometimes there's knowledge about the families in these cases. So they're always worth reading. Uh, marriage records. Some only just indicate a place. They don't say anything. Others actually give a, maybe a place of birth and occasionally a place of birth or residence for the parents. Again, different records in different locations. And one of the most fundamental rules is learn the records in the area where you're researching. Okay. And that means be persistent. Records are not the same in every jurisdiction. And as a good researcher, you're going, that's going to be something you want to make a first priority. Is you want to see how the records were created, how they were saved, and how they were organized. And then you get into the depth of understanding the records. Okay. Going to the records without an understanding, you may make a mistake and it may lead you on to a long journey back to correct it. Okay. Uh, court records often tell lots of information, and occasionally they're in places we would not think about. We're looking for a loose court case. Often those are in, in books, but they may not be indexed as, as deeply. Um, but reading them, and so uh, you know, I did do a transcription here instead of making you read it out of the book. This one's a tough book to read, by the way. Uh, it's from a court of pleas and court of sessions in Tennessee. It's in Rutherford County. And what you're going to find here is uh, Sylvester Blankenship is doing a deposition, and he's not doing a deposition about people now in Tennessee, or they are, but he knew them 25 years ago back in Chesterfield County, Virginia, and he goes on to tell about every name of every person uh, and then describing their relationship after he names who they all were and who they belong to. Then he proceeds to tell us how they've intermarried since, okay? And that some married in some other county and died with, a, with only one child. Okay, think about that detail. You only find that, though, by being persistent and following all the documents. These don't fall into your lap. And sometimes they do, uh, but they're going to usually require an effort. Um, some point of us to actually uh, look a little bit deeper. Now, I'll tell you what will help. Sometimes we're going to have diaries. And we might find journals and we might have some studied discussion of the travel. These are going to help us identify locations and movement, but also it's going to discuss the neighbors. That could be county histories. That can be local diaries, including doctors, ministers. Um, it, it can be part of court cases. Those are also things that often give us pieces of information. And, and so it may not be about your family directly. And when you first start, uh, use a broad comb. You kind of want everything at first, and then you can narrow down to determine what helps you most. 
Now, there's some great diaries of traveling that have been collected. I love this one. This is from Mary DeWeese. Uh, her whole journal has been transcribed, and the copies are there at the Library of Congress. It's also, it's actually uh, uh, at the University of Chicago as well. It was a joint process. But just pulling this one site, look at what, this is a good example. Having sight of limestone at three o'clock, landed safe at that place. Now, you not know the area, but that's limestone, Kentucky. It's on the Ohio River. What this tells you, uh, maybe not as much about people, about 100 people on the bank looking at us and inquiring about who their friends. And then they tell about who they stayed with. If you follow the diaries, then you're going to find out who was there and who was there first. Um, and as other folks came in, the, the pieces of information help you build a timeline and tie them together. Okay. Now, you might have to go and, and use some of the county histories. So this is from Pike County, Mississippi. Uh, it's a long old county, and their, their time period covered from 1798 until about 1876. That's the, that latter time period is when there were a lot of uh, what we often call mug books, but there were a lot of biographies, county histories compiled from then until 1900 and even on into the 20th century. Use them. Um, some are probably more reliable than others, but we want to always weigh the story and the information. We want to compare it to the facts and use it to build upon the research that we're trying to study, okay? Um, and so even in this one, you're going to, it, with, depending on when it was written, how accurate is that person? Well, you don't know until you check it out. And sometimes we're willing to trust information just because somebody said it. How many of you had an Aunt Sally that said you were um, descended from George Washington? Well, you know that's not true probably now. But either way, sometimes the most reliable people who told the stories maybe didn't know. Maybe it wasn't intentional, okay? Sometimes we'll get into letters. Uh, Thomas Hill Williams was the first senator of the territory of Mississippi, for example. Now, he was not from Mississippi until he went there on behalf of the president, Thomas Jefferson. Now, Thomas Hill Williams' papers have not been found. I, I can't find them. I have found the people who had them, and I have found bits and pieces of them but not this large set of papers. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Yes, it would be. Uh, but I'm working around. If I can't find what I want, I'm going to talk to the people and look for the ones who knew him, okay? And so basically, I just put a, a timeline together, and a timeline is not, it does not have to be complicated. And there are, you've heard some other opportunities. Listen, the folks who have done this of how they use it, sometimes they might use um, a software program and, and things to put things together. But it can be as simple as jotting things down in an order of date. And that's all this is here, that I can figure out where he was and who would have put him in that position. Um, he also is, has a congressional biography, but it doesn't tell me what I want to know. Okay, I know where he's buried. I know where he left a will. He left a will in this county. And he's buried in Nashville. Uh, but... The beginning and the end, I need the rest. Okay. <laughs> so when we take a look, where do my folks come from? Where are they going? And who did they associate with? I love this map because you can clearly see there is a difference between the Western states and the Central and the Eastern states. And if we understand, and if you will take some time to understand the difference in climate, difference in water, those are struggles that folks in various areas are still having today, okay? Those things that, that have always been a problem will continue to be a problem. We're not going to solve those. The, they don't just all go away. Uh, one of the things we can't, we, we can't make water very well, okay? And so that when we apply those things into the process, we don't make dirt very well. Uh, we, can, we can do some, but we can't solve those problems. We've got to work within the area that we have. So when we think about folks moving and, and beginning to think about locations um, as a Southerner, then I'm going to study not only the place where I am, 
But I'm going to study all of the pathways prior to that that folks would have used to come into this whole area. When I talk about coming across the Appalachians, in reality, they came down the Appalachians. They traveled right along the Great Valley Road, um, often referred to as the Great Valley Road, sometimes called um, you know, various pathways and names. And, and, and there were branches off into all the areas of Maryland and Virginia and even south into Carolina and Georgia. And so I can study those at the various time periods uh, and take the whole picture while I might still be focusing on something specific, okay? Notice that this is a county map, but it's a physiographic map. And that's because I'm heavy on the geology for me. I, I'm gonna always go back to that, those maps. I'm an ag guy, I'm a soil guy. I, it makes a difference. I can solve problems with that. You solve problems with where your skills are as you build upon it. But if I wanna follow somebody, one of, one of uh, you know how some guys are, they keep up with their time. I used to know um, when people were traveling, they kept up. It's like they tried to make a trip faster every time they did it. Well, we had a guy who was traveling. His name was William Brown. And he left uh, several diary entries, but here's one. Uh, from 1782, when he was traveling to Kentucky from Virginia. And so if I take all of those locations, and so I start with some cities, but you'll see I, I break them down into counties. You also notice that within his, his entries, he sometimes refers to the people that he saw or stayed with along the way. And that's important. I, I'm not going to go into all that at this point. But just realize there's a lot of stuff out there to help us understand who lived along the various pathways, who had businesses. And so there is a way to really learn almost about every step. Now, I'm going to take the time to identify every little place he passed with from Louisa County until he, he got down into the crossing the New River Valley and, and came into what then would have been Tennessee as he was going into Kentucky. Um, but what I did is took the same map and just path, path, made a path of those locations. It doesn't tell me specifics yet, but now I have the counties uh, and I can go back and look at, at uh, what the counties were at the time. This is a modern county map. And so I can use the Atlas of Historical Boundaries that's in your handout from the Newberry Library to actually determine what what counties they would have been, where records would have been created. We have so many opportunities to look at records and we have so many uh, resources available to us that we want to take advantage of them. Okay, so let me move quickly. I've already talked about this map and it, you know that you could study a little bit more about it, but what this shows you is that the unique nature of land. Now, I didn't learn about this map that you're gonna see until just a few years ago. This was a map by William Myers, a young man uh, that grew up not too far from where I live today. Uh, and he focused on <clears throat> all of the earliest trails and he spent time working with it. And um, it's published in the American Ethnology Report. And in fact, the font, this map that you're looking at was done uh, just after he had passed away, but it was the compilation of all his work. Now, I, I don't, you know, I think you can. Let me try something here. Let's see. Okay. There you go. I'll zoom in. Okay. So you see that all those little red lines have numbers on them. Okay. And based on where they are, and I know I'm, I'm moving around different areas, but I want to keep it there for just a second. These are the trails that have been identified. Not only did he, he use other maps, he used manuscripts, published works. And in fact, in your handout, there's a section about the William Myers maps toward the end of the mapping section. And there's a link to a PDF, and that is the full report. And so every one of these trails by number will be identified and then there's uh, often a descriptive piece of information with the sources included, okay? And then there's a good JPEG, good quality JPEG listed that will you'll be able to, to save, and then you can use to study this map. It's been amazing 
and and I've tried to share it often. It, it is something that's very fundamental to find pathways. And it's nice to know where they go, right? It just don't point to the mountain, um, so to speak, and say, okay, that's where we're going. <laughs> uh, we'd like to know a little bit more. In that, when you, it can be a little scary at times. Uh, it can be a little dark place and just not knowing what all's there. Now, there were lots of folks who were traveling at the time, and there's some great guides. Uh, the two of the ones that are the best in regard to fundamental Southern research are called the Phelps Traveler's Guide. And um, it was published about 1850. And so it, it's a little bit later. I'll show you an earlier one in just, just a second. But Phelps is really going to go ahead and deal with the change that's happening in transportation, which will be railroads, uh, canals, and stage. And, of course, steamboats along the river out. Uh, today, we might go buy an atlas from, from a big big store. But these are the, the ones that were available. They were widely available and published, and they're accessible. And so you'll find um, not only Phelps, but you'll find Darby's Immigrant's Guide uh, in your handout. And they're accessible. This one's published about 1812. There's some different versions. But when they refer to these states, remember, they're just being created outside the colonies. And there's going to be details about why people wanted to go there. And this is going to be one of the options to talk about why might why folks chose a particular area because a particular crop might be good, the quality of certain kinds of livestock, what was already there, and what was being successful. Because folks did not want to move just because it was free land if they could not make a living. You you can't you can't eat on free land. Think about it. If you can't make a crop there, uh, we don't have the support systems that we have today, and it would be really tough for people to make it. And so it's important that we focus on those issues uh, to really help us understand what they do, how do they make a living, uh, and who are the people that help them. Now, that's one of the reasons we want to use land records, and land records for most Southern research become a fundamental pillar of solving problems, okay? Every, every land document, lease, et cetera, will come up with who. It'll talk about the neighbors often in the description of the property, which will be uh, either meets and bounds or public land, but usually there's some discussion of the property. Uh, if it's a survey, it'll talk about who all's doing the survey. If there are witnesses to a deed, that's other people in the community. If there's a reference to a spouse or a dower relinquishment, then we have we have other connections. We also have the clerk who wrote them. And so we might also learn about whether this is a, a previous owner sale or if this is part of a grant process. That's a good beginning. But then we also are going to talk about where. And one of the one of the things I have learned is not <laughs> these are not always recorded in the county where the property is located. They should be maybe, and they do law maybe pass later, but you've got to be a persistent researcher. The place of recording, the place of the agreement. When, so once you find the deed, then it might be in a different place than you suspect. And often that can be because the people are traveling um, or maybe the courthouse is closer to where they're going to be now and that's okay. It's in. It's within the state, et cetera. Although I have seen them recorded somewhere else, and somebody will bring them with the power of attorney across uh, halfway across the country. Where is the seller? Where is the buyer? Where is the property? What jurisdiction is it going to fall under? And and you need to know that eventually because there are going to be taxes. There's going to be ways to follow it. Um, and sometimes. If people are in different places, we have what's called certification or attestation. So it might be that one of the people who are, is a witness is here, and that court testifies that they saw him and they said this, and then the, the, the buyer might be somewhere else, and one of the other witnesses or a surveyor might be somewhere else. Those are all additional jurisdictions. And uh, the precise description of the property, you know, is valuable. And so we work with that and add to that. And lastly, we, we got to know when, uh, the dates, and that's important. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the essential facts of when, when we're talking about when something happened, 
then we got to know. And if we're dealing with grants or we're dealing with something about the law, it's important to know when that happened. I will tell you that uh, over the years of studying that I came across a deed abstract from one of the attorneys that I, I respected. He was long gone. But I found where he did uh, the way he did deed abstracts. And that's an important thing, a skill that we can often uh, gain as researchers. But I really like the fact that this attorney, and this was, they created it, um, uh, True and Dorsey, the things that they ask for. Uh, and I think you can, you, can, you can read it well enough here that you can figure out what they saw as important. And those are not necessarily things that we might think about uh, thinking, oh, I need to make sure I included that point. And that's one of the reasons why often we might do a transcription, a full accounting, as opposed to an abstract, because of our understanding. Okay. Now, certainly, we know that the folks coming before us knew the value of land, and it's important to the family. And I think we want to also, when we look at that, uh, then we also recognize that and identify that as an important uh, process of, of something for us to look at. And if we have parts of the documents uh, as we're running across them, um, maybe we don't have a citation. We can follow up with the same clues from the various parts of the document to find those original documents. Um, because they could be in different counties, and if we follow the pieces of information, uh, we find the answers. It's amazing sometimes that things could be so difficult and so simple at the same time, but that is just the way they are, correct? It is just the way it is. So that means we need a good plan, uh, a plan that advances, that moves us toward a clear directional question. What is it I want to know? What is it that this is pointing me to that I need to discover? Should I identify the, the reliable, the good, solid resources that are more likely to answer that question? In the process, I might do some rocking in my chair and I might do some uh, mulling myself and think, is there something else that would really help me provide some more related information? And I promise you, put a timeline on it because as you're look, moving through this, you need to keep yourself sharp, but on point because it's too easy to get distracted, okay? Um, we're not gonna get everything done we wanna do anyway, but let's get as much as we can in regard to telling these stories. Now, let's move quickly into another point because when we talk about South, do you know we talk about that we're part of what's called the Bible Belt? Um, in fact, it's been said that I live, I live in the buckle of the Bible Belt. There are great religious publications all throughout the South, like this. This is the, the Nashville Louisville Christian Advocate. It is a Methodist publication. I thought I'd give you a quick example of the um, immense amount of information that is found within the Christian Advocates, okay? Um, here's an example. Obituaries, which we would love because they detail um, lots of information. One of those is clipped in a scrapbook. The others I've transcribed from the actual advocate. It was there, but I wanted you to know that that often within um, in church collections, they would have clipped the obituaries of members or preachers or folks they knew from the Christian advocate for their region, and then they would have them. That's how, how these were obtained uh, in that case. Um, they often talk about folks who left the area and moved far away. And so you're going to, even if you lose somebody, and it also talks about their family and important things in their life. And usually these are better than the normal obituaries that are, would be found in the newspaper. Okay. They're usually written by a friend, somebody that knew them well. And they also are going to say, hey, this person also lived in this uh, other area. So even though this one ran in the Louisville and Nashville, they're saying, hey, run this in the Memphis and Arkansas copy too, because she had connections to Arkansas. So not only are there obituaries, discussions about, and this is just Methodist, um, they have marriages. So if you're in an area where there's burned uh, records, then these often fill in some of the gaps as well. But more importantly, these often 
Um, and, and there, almost every religious group has some sort of publication that may be smaller, maybe not as large, but the, the great variety of that. By the way, don't ignore, if your folks were Baptist, don't ignore the Methodist publications. Um, you'd be surprised how many of a neighbor will be found within them. I, I've looked, I've used them. Uh, that, now, one other book, this is uh, by Nathan Bangs, and there's something similar. I share a few of these um, in, your, in your handout, this one in particular. Uh, because this was a large national organization, Methodist Church, so quickly, this book helps us confirm about ministers. And the South was filled with circuit riding ministers, Methodist, Baptist, uh, Christian types, other types. And we often need to follow where those records are. But in the appendix of this particular book by Nathan Bangs, A History of the Methodist Episcopal Church, then he identifies by year people who were ordained. Uh, and then uh, if there's a second date, if they died or if they were dismissed or other issues, for example, uh, Benjamin Ogden ordained in 1786 and he died in 1834. This is right. And, and this is fairly comprehensive, and I uh, have found it to be very helpful, okay? So I just wanted to point that. Now, how do, how do I recommend using this? Um, just like everything else, start local. Start where you are. And if it's a, a particular group, then figure out what they are, independent, congregational, are they part of something else? Are they in the same building? Um, and then find out about local folks' collection. And hopefully, it's so much easier if they have given them to a library or special collection or even a university, but they're not always there. And in the South, people hold on to stuff really tightly. And <laughs> you might need to, you might need to look and ask in somebody's house, uh, consider local uh, county museums, even if, if they know about them. And some of the things I've shown you as stuff that I have found that somebody like, here's a scrapbook, uh, let me borrow to have it uh, microfilmed and scan and give it back to them. What's the fate of the local records? Is there an organization? Uh, is there a group? And that's going to be different probably in just about every jurisdiction. There's not one uh, in most cases. And don't, don't neglect uh, collections at church-affiliated universities. Uh, there's, there is a, a group of uh, uh, church-affiliated universities. They've got a website. They've got library special collections. So again, this is the level to look at those things, okay? And I think sometimes it's probably, you're probably thinking, oh, wow, um, I, I need some specifics. Uh, yeah, we want some specifics. Let me give you one specific example real quickly here. I mentioned that most of the folks who moved into the South were often those first people are the, are the ways to identify them. This is Henry Ayers, who is a Revolutionary War soldier, uh, and you're you're going to learn he's from Virginia, but he, he's going to travel through most of the southern states to get to his final. I've done a timeline using his pension record, uh, his widow's pension record, and the pension records of two other witnesses. Okay, so basically uh, about four different doc, uh, four two pensions, but four different uh, documents and some other things too. I did a timeline and identified each time and then uh, breaking down what happened in that time period. So if, you, if you'll notice here, uh, let me blow it up just a little bit here. I think you can see it a little better. Okay, born about 1753, that came from, uh, and let me show, show you one more time. Okay, um, what I did is I have every line sourced so when I blow it up, I'm, I'm cutting that off. But know that every line sources back to where it came from, okay? So where his wife was born, based on testimony, he was born in Dinwiddie County, um, or she was born in the year in Dinwiddie County. He said he entered the service in Bedford County. It uh, doesn't identify where it was, but we've got his, his uh, uh, unit and that sort of thing. That, that's what he said. We found references to their marriage in Surrey County, North Carolina. And this is the time when there were bans. And so there's that discussion of there was no record uh, in, the, in the court at the time. There was, they married before a JP, but that he said that, that you know, they didn't have any. 
they didn't have any records. That was the custom, um, but that they were married. And there were witnesses to their marriage as well. And so they knew the people had met, um, come to find out the other person is ends up being the brother-in-law well actually it's the sister-in-law's husband but we're detailing it where they're living they go to south carolina in 1785 and then they move from south carolina and all this is in the pension uh and in these notations that they moved in 1799 they've lived there for about 43 years uh, and then his testimony was given in 1832, and he received the pension until he died. Okay, and I think it was 33 when he died. Then she uh, picked up a widow's pension. Lots of information. Timeline will help you, and I would encourage you to think about using one. If you're not, definitely have a plan. But in the process of doing this, connecting people, the places, their neighbors, and the events that happen in their life, it helps us to be focused on what's really there. Um, I always want to focus on the sound principles of research. It's important when you're researching in the South that you track the right guy or the right girl. They all have the same name. Trust me. <laughs> you need to know something about them more than the name tag they wear. If not, you're looking at the wrong person probably. And so it's really important that you, you follow their steps and you make sure that's the one you're looking at. You want to follow the possible routes, and that's where maps will help. You want to look where they're most likely going to be based on what you know about them and the profile that you're building. Uh, you, you've, got to, you've got to have that support group. They become the locators. They become the finders. And having that same name is just not enough. Um, even with my own grandfather, the number, his name was Ernest. He spelled it E-A-R. Spelling doesn't count, Okay. There's so many earnest lows, I really have to work to figure out which one is which. And there are no clones. Same person in two places at the same time. Okay, make sure your ancestors have their children at the right time. And don't ignore the small clues. Sometimes they really make a difference. I want you to know that you find so much in the South and across this country in cases that have been appealed beyond just the local level. And we have a great service and access to Case Law Access Project now. This is at Harvard Law School um, at this website. It's in the handout. And this is a, a way to look for cases that have been appealed from a local circuit court. And so you can search across all the time period. This has been collected from uh, court reporters and it'll help you learn the possibility of a family member or family in general within a location who were involved in a court case, that court case may be exactly what you need to find the answer. In your handout, I talk a little bit more about court cases in general, and I've enlisted, have lots of other resources that will help you, uh, including to get started with stuff, go to the Family Search Wiki, learn about the courts, learn about the land, uh, learn about what is existing in that state. Become an expert on the area where you're researching. Understand why the records were created, how they were organized, and where they're housed today. If you do that, um, you'll be solving lots of problems <laughs> and finding lots of answers. So take some time. But I do want you to think about this. I want you to think about that our ancestors made choices based upon their skills, based upon their family safety. Some made good choices. Others made foolish choices, and others sometimes didn't have a choice. We have folks who are forced to move not because that they want to go, but because of the condition of their life, okay? And the condition of the situation at the time. Many folks had forced, we have folks who were enslaved. They didn't choose where they went often. So look at the whole story. Listen to the neighbors. Listen to the story. Listen to the time frame. What kind of person were they? and determine what records can help you understand more about that individual. Please take time to go look at the Meyer map. If you're interested in trails in the South and you've not seen this before, figure out how to use it. Um, enjoy, enjoy finding it, but be persistent. Research is important because the stories are not found, 
until they're identified and we listen to them. There's going to be a lot of stories in our life that will never hear the truth. And everyone that we're able to find, identify, and listen to makes that story more complete and more enduring. And I encourage you to take these fundamental resources and your persistence as a researcher and make today a good research day. Okay, is that fair? <laughs> um, and I know I've opened lots of doors, but I'm hoping that you'll find ways to go walk through them, take the resources that uh, are included in your handout, and uh, feel free to encourage other folks to help you. It's always good to have a good genealogical buddy to say, what in the world were you thinking? Because sometimes we don't have the best idea, and sometimes if we'll have a friend challenge us, it'll make a difference. Anyway, thank you for joining me. It's a real pleasure. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. And by the way, if you talk, find me later in time and you still got a question, it doesn't have to be today, feel free. I'd be glad to answer them at that point. And thank you for supporting Allen County and this library. It's a wonderful tool for all of us. Thank you so much for a great presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, we do have some questions for you. Okay. So we got a couple of questions about the book. Um, the land use book. And I was wondering if you could please remind us of the title. Yeah. Uh, hold on. I think I can pull it up real quickly here. It's the history of agriculture in the Southern United States to 1860. Uh, it's authored by Lewis Cecil Gray and Esther K. Thompson. Thank and, you. and it is available on Hottie Trust. If there's a copy in Allen County Public Library as well, but it, it's available at Hottie Trust and also Google Bert Books. And there's the link to it at the top of that screen. Thank you. Um, on one of the slides, there was a map of the Kentucky military districts. And we got a question um, about that. And if you could please explain what you mean by military districts. <laughs> okay. Uh, this, this is what the, it's in Kentucky, but this is the Virginia military district for Virginia, uh, uh, soldiers who served more than three months during the revolutionary war. They were granted, um, uh, the possibility of land. And at that point in time, open land across the mountain, which would have been in Kentucky. And, um, and so the military district was surveyed. So that land then uh, surveys could be made within uh, the military districts for that state. So let's say a gentleman served in Virginia and he could apply for a warrant because he served three months. He could apply for a warrant for land. It would be entered. It, he would go to the uh, surveyor over in Kentucky and they um, he, he would be looking at a particular location. They would survey the land within the military district. And then once once that had been fully processed, it would be recorded in the county. Uh, and there were some counties. They were Virginia counties early before it became a state in 1792. Uh, but th then a deed would be created. Then he could buy and he could sell that property after that. So the military district was originally reserved for those um, Virginia soldiers who served a certain period of time. And they were allowed certain number of acres based upon their rank um, and service time. Thank you. Um, this next question is wondering, where do you find deed abstracts done by law firms? <laughs> oh, uh, I, wish I, I wish I could answer that across the board completely. Uh, let, me, let me answer, add one more thing to that previous one. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in this military district, go to a place called the Kentucky land office it's it's a governmental office and there's great resources and discussions uh at the land office about all the land and all the records that are there and most of them are available through the kentucky land office um okay finding that abstract was a uh it was included within a court case so no his records were not uh i, I wish they were uh, i wish that uh, true and Dorsey's records, I, I, I wish they'd have left them for me. Of course, they were long gone. But generally, most most ca uh, things that are done between a, a client and a, an attorney, they're private. You know that. So usually those records do not become public. 
but but you can find their work within court cases that where they represent individuals and that's exactly what they were doing they the the survey and the abstracts were included in some of the cases and so i've just studied those cases over the year and i've copied those as an example of here's what somebody in that time period a good attorney used uh, to to prove his points and so that's that's how i have found them and i don't know uh very rarely have i had access to any attorney's real records though um, unless they were lot now there are attorneys that are living that do land work uh, that i know in nashville and, and and we often share information but this was a deceased these are deceased attorneys so sounds good um so this next question is asking about um any specific resources that you might know of or two types of migration in the South. So she's asking about forced migration of enslaved people from the East Coast um, to cotton and sugar growing states and migration trails of free African-Americans before 1850, if you might have resources for those types of migration. Okay, <clears throat> so what you see before you is that William Meyer map. And even though it's talking about early trails, the manuscripts that he uses within the PDF that's attached in your handout is a great resource for uh, both the, the, the period of enslavement of those enslaved individuals who are moving. Because remember, these trails do not change dramatically until the 20th century. So until when we get railroads, then those railroads, for example, parallel the roads we've already created. And so the, the in, in, in that time period is by 1850. And so you're, you, the only thing you're changing is the transportation methods. So you want the manuscript collections. And I would, I would suggest that you want to use the governmental documents that I refer to uh, within the handout. Uh, I'm going to say tax list in particular. Are, and, and they're going you're going to be able to identify when folks were if you know where they were and you're trying to track where they came from uh if you'll follow in the taxing documents year by year what you're going to find is when there was a, an increase in number of individuals brought to an area for example migrated to louisiana from north carolina for example um with that point in time if you've looked at the history of that i guarantee you that there was somebody in that area who came with those enslaved persons, probably from where they came from in North Carolina. And often I'll find those references, not maybe in the county history, but in the resources that are listed within the footnotes of those county histories. And then I just chase back to those documents. Usually there'll be some references. And by the way, the court case references that I refer to have been some of the best resources on identifying um, where there were enslaved people even involved in a situation in an area where their names were included. One of the best things for finding those cases that would help me resolve those problems specifically. Thank now, that's you. just the beginning. That's just the beginning. But uh, go back to the Myers map and then just think about those other resources. Uh, I can't think of a, of a book or a resource because most of that is going to require individual work and it's going to require uh, just don't give up and, and be the persistent person. If you don't get the answer the first time, just look in three other places. So I think we have time for one more question. So okay. if we um, don't get to your question, feel free to send us an email at genealogy at acpl.info. And um, also, if you'd like a copy of the chat for today's um, Zoom presentation, we'll be glad to send that as well. So our email, um, our email's in the chat, but um, for the last question, so this person is wondering, is there a central source for any of the marriage bans, um, specifically <laughs> for marriage bans in Virginia and North Carolina? Um, it, yes, in North Carolina in particular, they've been compiled into something called North Carolina marriage bonds. Because both states required a bond in addition to the band. So instead of looking for a marriage license, um, both states have tried to do a compilation. And so if you look for North Carolina marriage bonds, uh, there's, there's, there's a, 
publication of those for years it was on microfiche but that's that's widely available at lots of libraries and online but look look for that term marriage bond but for the state instead of marriage ban thank you you're welcome um, so thank you again so much for presenting today we really appreciate your time and um Again, for, for anyone who would like a copy of the chat or if you have any questions um, after today's presentation, feel free to send us an email at genealogy at acpl.info. So thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Kate. Bye-bye. Bye, Kurt.